Okay. So, uh, yesterday we did this introduction on, uh, on big data and we point out that uh, we are interested in this course on two dimensions, what is called variety and what is called velocity. The rest of the day yesterday we spent it on variety. Uh, so today what we will do uh, is spending it uh, uh, on velocity. Okay. So uh, uh, my first talk will be about uh, claiming that we are in a world where strings are everywhere. Okay. And then showing you that uh, there is a way to master it that is under the big data technology hood, but actually it comes from a long time ago. Uh, so this research comes from the early 2000s and is built on theory that comes from the late 90s. Um, I will go through two technologies that are called Data Stream Management System, the SMS, and Complex Event Processor, uh, CHEP. Uh, using a modeling framework from uh, colleagues of mine in Polytechnico, they did a very nice survey and they proposed this uh, functional processing, deployment, interaction, data, time, rule, and language models. Okay, so th that is the kind of talk. Then Ricardo will uh, actually give you a, a more uh, technical talk, which is uh, about Esper, which is uh, one industrial attempt. Actually, it's an open source attempt, but it uses a language which is also used by Oracle Compass Event Processor. It's called EPL. Uh, so you will see how what I'm talking about in theory can become practice. And then we will have uh, demos, right, in the end. OK. So let's start. So when I say it's a streaming world, what I have in mind are scenarios like the following, right? Financial markets, uh, sensor networks, social networks. And what they have in common is they all generate data over time. Uh, and they can come to you very, very fast. Uh, if you think about uh, financial markets, basically there are thousands, hundreds, thousands <coughs> of uh, different labels that are continuously evaluated, right? And the number of f financial transactions that you can monitor worldwide is extremely large. And sensor network with IoT coming on, and the Internet of Things coming on, can become even large scale than the financial market. It can be thousands of times much uh, 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 broader. And social networks are probably the one that I like more because of those that you can touch easily, right? Because the other two, we may not have real experience of them, eh? but all of us have some experience uh, of social networks. But what uh, I really want you to get is that it's not just that there are streams, okay? You can put the stream at rest and then you treat it uh, as standard data, okay? What we want is reactive answers. Uh, when I say reactive answer, I'm imagining things like those that you read here. Uh, so based on the last seconds of transaction, what shall I buy and what shall I sell now? Uh, this is the standard question of algorithmic trading. Uh, and in this setting, you should think that uh, I wrote seconds, but many of the successful businesses here are treating milliseconds. Eh? So they are buying space in data center, just uh, the room aside the data center of NASDAQ, and they are optimizing the network, uh, uh, the network traversal, okay? Because they want to be milliseconds. They want to gain every small fraction that you can get out of that. Eh? So time matters, eh? reactiveness. In the um, sensor network, I've been r running s several uh, discussions with people in an uh, oil and gas company. Okay? And here the question is, shall I keep drilling based on the last sensor observations? Eh? So w what's the problem? So you're drilling something, okay, and you have down there uh, a piece of machinery that costs millions of euros. But what really matters is that it costs uh, thousands of euros per second it drills. Hmm? And it costs that amount even if you stop drilling. So you should never stop drilling, basically. Huh? But there are moments where things are happening that you better stop because uh, the worst thing that can happen is that that thing gets stuck and you have to pull it out. Okay? And if it is 10 kilometers down into Earth, pulling it out can take hours. And therefore, you're paying thousands of euros to pull it out and thousands of euros to put it back. Okay? So it's really a complex problem. You have to look at all these observations and you have to take the continuous decision. Shall I keep drilling? Shall I stop drilling? Shall I do this manual intervention there? Shall I put that? So that is the kind of reactiveness that they are thinking about. And on social network, well, all, all of us have, have this feeling that it will be nice to be able to follow conversation 
uh, by making sure that you are not losing something, right? Because you know several hashtags that you want to follow, several users that you want to follow, and you stick to them. But you realize quite often that something else is happening that you are not monitoring, and you lose it, you are losing it. Okay, so standard question that uh, Facebook, Twitter are posing themselves: are which are the top hashtag, which are the top user, which are the top words entities eh, in the last few minutes because those are going to be important for my users and also for my infrastructure if I want to balance the computation. Eh? So requirement here is continuous processing of these streams and being reactive in answering. Eh? You should not wait long enough for the information that you gave her to be obsolete because that somehow is the, is the problem, right? If you wait 10 hours to give an answer that you should have given in one minute, you waste 10 hours, right? because all that time you simply got data that makes no sense anymore. And the number of domains where this uh, is meaningful is not limited to those three, there are more. Uh, so for instance, intrusion detection on uh, network security, fraud detection more broadly, okay? Uh, emergency response services, transportation and logistics in town, across town, within uh, uh, companies, supply chain optimization, system monitor, all the check-in uh, inspection, okay, and so forth. So there is really a, a number of places where, what I said, streams plus reactive answer is uh, something that is required. And this is backing up a slide that I did uh, yesterday, right? This one where uh, in this IBM report, they were pointing out that there is volume, there is variety, there is veracity, but there is velocity, okay? And that's what we are going to do today. And is also giving more information about this slide that I gave yesterday. So the traditional way is you take data, you put them in a repository, and then uh, you do post hoc analysis and you get some answer out. The new way, the big data way, huh, is uh, you take the data, you throw them through your queries and you continuously answer them. Right? So you get a, a continuous set of answer out uh, of your data. Right? So the data are in motion. But you don't put them at rest anymore. Now, have you seen this before? It's called the hype cycle. Uh, it basically says that uh, every technology starts with nobody knowing it. When it goes up, everybody is expecting something of it, and it should be the solution for every problem on Earth. Then people start using it, and they discover that actually it's not useful, okay? And goes down in this, which is called uh, the trough of disillusionment. And then there are two things that may happen, okay? Technologies simply disappear, because they become obsolete before they get somehow useful or they slightly go up with what is called the slope of enlightenment and they get to what is called the plateau of productivity. Okay? So Garner, which you probably know, used this to place any technology that comes uh, into the monitor that they are doing. Um, back in 2012, this was uh, one of the uh, hype cycles that they were proposing and you can see, or may maybe you cannot see, uh, that some of uh, the domains I was talking about social network analysis, advanced fraud detection, where there as, uh, I mean, places where solutions are emerging and people expect whatever from them. But even more, uh, up here you see, okay, social analytics, that was uh, the other one. Mm? But up to the top, uh, you see complex event processing. Uh? So that was the technology back in 2012 that uh, was recognized to be the solution when you have velocity. Okay, so it was there up to, to that hype. Um, if you look into something else, so this report is from uh, Forrester, you see similar things, okay? So these uh, two observers of the market actually were detecting very similar uh, results because as you can see, right, big data platform for real-time analytics was uh, one of the most revolutionary um, technology coming into the, the market, and business event processing and rule platform, which is yet another way to call complex event processor, was also there in this top list, okay? So there was hype back in 2012. And there was also, there was also a market. Mm -hmm. So this picture here 
comes from uh, 2014, so it's a redone of uh, the one in 2012, and tells you what I said before. There is an history here. Okay, so it's not product that pop out from nothing. Huh? The first product here date back 98. Okay, and this is uh, showing the number of companies that started up, created a product, were bought by somebody else that eventually merged some product with some other products. Okay, so apart from many of them that died, okay, there is a market. Okay, so there are products behind those uh, hypes that I showed before. And um, to, to tell you that uh, this is still in scope of big data, I pick up this uh, 2014 uh, quarter three from um, Forrester Wave that is positioning the best product for big data. Okay, so up here what you see are those that are leaders in the market and also have a strong strategy. Uh, it means that uh, currently they have proved to be able to do the work on velocity and they have uh, a plan of work that based on the state of the art, the current research trends, uh, is also showing high potentiality of future development. Huh? And uh, up here you see the, the best one. I don't want to comment much, but in case uh, you want to, to go and check out the product, this slide is basically giving you the link that directly goes uh, to the, the product that are behind that graph. Okay, so you see big names, huh? SAP, um, IBM, and uh, typical and so forth, right? So I mean, not the, the first guys that come. All right, but now that we know that there is hype, that uh, somehow this is meaningful, probably you want to know what they are, right? So um, my best, to my best knowledge, the only place where you can have a sort of academic uh, view on this uh, strange word is this survey that is done by two colleagues of mine, uh, Gianpaolo Kugel and Alessandro Margara. The, the, it's quite, I mean, old in, in, our, in our world because it's already three years old, which means that it is at least four years old in terms of content because it, took, it takes one year to get published, right? <laughs> but still, I believe that when you look into it, you recognize that it may lack some products, which I'm not in any case commenting, but most of the important models are there, okay? So it's not capturing the entire market. So if you go there, those 24 academic products that are written there probably are obsolete. You will probably find at least 10 more or 20 more that are results that are not there. And the same for the industrial ones. And so none of those that you saw in, mass, in my last slide are, are there, okay? Because are products of the last two years. Hmm? But the modeling framework, I believe, is something that really makes sense, okay? So that is what I'm going to illustrate you, this modeling framework that they did. And they tried to create something that is a common idea of what we are going to do here, and they call it information flow processing. Hmm? You will learn now that there are, as I said before, DSMS and compressive end processor. They try to bring the two things together because they are observing that also industry is trying to do that. So if you go on the market, you don't find a compressive event processor or a data stream management system. You always find products that are a kind of hybrid eh, between these two. So what they did was uh, coming up with this idea that uh, uh, there are information for processing and that uh, um, what uh, it matters is that uh, the information for processing engine are processing the information online and they process information that come from sources and they send information out to things. Huh? That is uh, somehow the, the general architecture of this system. And what they do, they filter, they combine, they aggregate flows, and they do it item by item. Okay, so uh, these flows are actually discretized in some way, and then you put together these uh, items, uh, whatever these uh, items are. Um, this is because, uh, as I said before, uh, you have these two traditions. Uh, the one of databases that started from traditional databases, create active databases, and then went uh, to the SMS. And on the other side, you have all the event-based systems that uh, eventually uh, created the composite event processing world. <coughs> so let's try to see uh, what's there. Yeah, so if you remember, okay, back in the 80s, there were databases, okay, maybe you don't remember. <laughs> uh, and 
what the database is, is basically something very passive, right? So if you don't ask something, it will stay silent, right? <laughs> there is no reason for a database to tell you anything. Um, th that's it, okay? But there was clearly a need uh, to put some of the business logic into the database, right? So what you see is that your Java code that runs on a database normally is very slow, and as soon as you can push part of the business logic into the database, you become much faster. Huh? And especially if you are able to put triggers, uh, which is the standard way to, to, to make the database active, then the triggers are written in the same SQL language of the rest, so they can get optimized, and re I mean, really, you gain a lot. And that is the first attempt to do something that goes in the direction of streams. Right? It's called active database because uh, somehow they do things even if you don't ask. Right? So they keep checking consistency. Uh, they may alert you if something is happening that should not happen, and things like that. And normally, uh, you distinguish between uh, two different uh, kind of active databases, those that are called close, because they can only digest events that they produce. Okay, and somehow this is the kind of database that will tell you something because you ask it to do it, but after a while we stop telling you things uh, because the, unless you input new data, everything that must be told will end up in a, in a moment. Huh? So the other idea is the open database, okay, where somehow the source of event can comes from outside, uh, and this is much less frequent. Uh, if you think there is uh, no standard way to write a trigger that starts from Java. Okay, if you want to inject something to a database, you have to do it programmatively. Okay, you, there is no trigger that is written on uh, real-world stuff uh, and that does something into a database. And what uh, happened is that uh, um, they said, well, why don't we treat streams? Okay, so it, it appears that uh, uh, th these streams are becoming very interesting. Uh, so it was late 90s, 98 more or less. And they face the, a problem that is pretty complex, right? So a stream potentially is infinite, uh, it's not bound. It starts now, but it can finish whenever in the future. Mm? And now the point is how can I treat this? Because uh, if it is finite, I know how to do it. Okay, but if it is infinite, basically I have no idea how to do it with database technology. But before showing you how, okay, let's think about it a bit more. Okay, okay, it's infinite, right? But what is it? Uh, in many cases, it is uh, coming from some dynamic system. So there is the word, you put a sensor, and you're observing it. Okay, so if you think this word is it, not something that will change uh, without uh, some logic, right? It, it has its own rules. Uh, and most likely you can capture it. Okay, you can create a model of a word that represents most of it. Huh? That's what a dynamic system is. And in, in any dynamic system, there is this idea that if you have enough states, huh? so if you can remember enough steps back in, in time, then you can capture the full state and you don't have to remember all the inputs. Huh? So you can actually look to a part of the inputs in order to give the outputs, and that's enough. Huh? Once you have estimated the current state, you will be able to keep providing output based on input without actually uh, keeping the entire input set, okay? And that is the way they design the data stream management system. They don't take the entire stream, okay? They take a portion of the stream which is long enough to capture what you have to do, your business logic, okay? And that is why so I wrote it's a flow of information that comes to you, okay? So you should not think of it as a lake. Right? It's really a stream, okay? It comes to you and you don't have to wait for the entire stream to, to end before you can do something with it. Right? You can process it while it comes, and probably what comes now matters much more than what was here two years ago, okay? Probably you can have forgotten it. And so, what's the paradigmatic change? Well, it's a very important thing. So what they said is, we should no longer use uh, persistent data we have a query on demand, which is called one-time semantics. Okay? So everything that I have in the database is true now, and it will be true tomorrow, 
and I should not think about uh, time, okay? So that is the standard database word. I should use transient data and continuous query, yeah, which is called continuous semantics. Yeah? So I have to rethink entirely the database because I have different operators that will operate on flows of data that will change and I have to trigger things while the data comes, okay? So that's, it's a great change. Yeah? It's the one that was illustrated in those black slides that I show, yeah? but it's it doesn't date uh, two years ago, 2014, okay, it dates 98, okay, those are the days where in Stanford they came up with, with this idea. So if you want to visualize it, there is uh, some aspect of the words that you can think it's a dynamic system, there is uh, data that comes from it, maybe through observation that uh, were done by sensor, maybe by people that tweet, okay, that doesn't matter, okay, it's still a flow of information that comes to you, and what you have is a query, that I represent in here as something that is stay, okay? It's, it's really a piece of your system. Huh? And uh, it reads data through a window, okay? So it's, it's not looking to the entire set of data. He has a window and you only can see what uh, is out of the window. Huh? Data pass by and they change, okay? So you keep seeing different things. Huh? And uh, why the data pass by, you register a query, we generate a stream of answers. Huh? That is the the way you can visualize this paradigmatic change. Uh, the query are there, they are registered on the streams. You look to the stream through windows that are large enough to capture the information you need in your application scenario, and then you generate a stream of answer out. Okay, so that is the way database did it, okay? But in parallel, there was a, a different community that comes from publish subscribe system, more the, the internet, the network, okay? Where a completely different uh, way of thinking was present, okay? So in public subscribe system, you probably know, what you want to do is uh, to have uh, a number of users that are peers, okay? They tell each other, I'm interested in this, and then some communication network will spread the messages, okay? So you put the message, you publish the message, and then there is a middleware that spread them around. Uh, they get distributed. So if you want to visualize it, uh, imagine that we are in the scenario of uh, yesterday. So we, are, we want to detect fire, okay? And so these agents here are registering uh, uh, what they want, okay? So they are saying, I would like to get messages that. This one wants a fire alarm in any place. This one wants uh, something that starts with fire in any place. This one wants whatever, but it must be at floor one, okay? Then somebody, one of the peers, publish uh, a message. There is a fire alarm at the first floor, okay? And what the middleware is supposed to do is to route the message and, uh, if needed, to multicast it, okay? So if uh, multiple copies must go to multiple recipients, it's copy it and send it out. Hmm? So what you see is that this message basically should go to everybody, okay? It was that registered. And um, if there is another message like this, uh, so, sorry. So there is a, a fire training at first floor. What you expect is that it's not going here, right? Because this is looking for fire alarm. It's going here because it's looking for fire something, okay? And it's going here because it's happening at the first floor, right? Uh, so th that is what Publish Subscribe does. Uh, you put this uh, kind of queries where the idea is you put a set of conditions one after each other, normally it's a Boolean conjunction, okay? And then the system will do all the routing for you. Okay, so what's a complex event processor? Uh, it's a publish, subscribe, plus more sophisticated rules. Uh, so instead of only do filtering, because what you saw is basically filtering, nothing else, uh, what you normally do in complex event is looking for sequence of events that matters, okay? We saw it yesterday evening. Uh, if there is a rise in temperature and there is a smoke, then I should rise a fire alarm, okay? Yesterday it was a bit different. It was a uh, very CO2, right? Uh, and there is rising temperature, I should use that kind uh, of uh, uh, extinguishing, and if there is a uh, heat, uh, but of different kind, then I should not, right? That was the example. Yeah? But th this is complex event processing, right? So set of conditions under which something else, a, a new measure should be created out of the uh, simple messages that you are receiving in.
Okay, so you create new messages based on message that you find. And what matters is that they come in sequence. Eh? So if uh, A is followed by B, then write C. Hmm? That is the kind of, uh, of operator that is central to complex event processing. Now, what's the situation? Okay, you, you saw it in previous slide, but uh, I want to make it sure that uh, you grasp it to, to the level of confusion. Okay, so in 2007, there was uh, a qu quite an attempt to go down and check what was present on the market and in academia. And what they found is that this is really a tower of Babel. Mm -hmm. so everybody was talking about complex event processing, but uh, it, they were doing it in very different ways. Okay, so nobody was really know w if they were talking about the same, if there were substantial difference, is something comparable with something else. And um, the problem, as you saw, is that uh, there are a number of communities. Uh, we saw the, data the database community and the, um, what is it, the middleware community contributing, yeah? but actually it, it's much broader. Okay, so there are people from uh, process and automation that are thinking at this, there are people from uh, uh, intrusion detection that are thinking at this. So I mean, different domains that run into streams create a domain specific solution. Database and, and internet people create general purpose solution. Okay, and, and this all comes into one single bubble tower. And so, the point is that uh, my colleagues ask themselves, can we put some order here? Okay, so can we actually cast all of them into some framework that allow us to understand it? Okay, and if you go and check if the situation now is, uh, is different, you will find that actually it is not. Huh? So if you go on Quora and uh, you ask a question, what's the difference between a compressive event processor and a stream management system, you will get one of these four answers. Eh? Some people will say they are terribly different because they have different approaches. Eh? One will say they are exactly the same. Okay? Another one will say there is uh, much more intelligence in a compressive event processor system than in a data stream. Another will say data stream management system are the best thing and compressive event processor can be subsumed. Okay? So basically there is no common understanding here. And unfortunately, the vendors are not really helping, okay? Because what you find mo in most of the tools is that uh, they are just opposing the two functionality. Eh? The, what uh, Ricardo will show you is that in EPL, this event processing language, they have feature of data stream management system, feature of complex event processing. You can write very ugly query that mix up everything in one single framework. And if you have to solve one problem, there are at least 10 solutions, okay? syntactic differences that will provide exactly the same result. So the survey, yeah? compare different systems, compare different approaches, help people communicate, isolate open issues, which matters in academia, of course, because you want to do more research and identify challenges. Okay. And of course, then they also did it and they also create uh, a, a framework, a language and so forth, but I will not illustrate this part. So if you are interested in what they did after, okay, you can go and check out uh, Gianpaolo Kugola website and you will learn what they did. Okay, so let's go back to this slide. Okay, so I was pushing it to you uh, 10 minutes ago, but let's go, go on top of it again with what I said. Okay, so you have this picture here, there are sources, they send flows of information, okay? And they are discretized, eh? so they come as information items to you. Then there is this uh, information flow processing engine that have rules that are written by some expert, okay? And these rules are those that are used uh, in this uh, system in order to produce other flows of information out that go to sinks. Okay, uh, that, that is the, the generic uh, idea. And what uh, you, you probably want to see now is that uh, there are filtering combination, aggregation, and uh, you can write them in these different languages and all of them somehow satisfy the same requirements. Uh, that is uh, probably w what you would like to see. And they did it in this way, so they said, I can actually get this done if uh, I create a model that explains how functionally this system works. I can explain the processing that they have. I can show that uh, 
systems that are centralized and systems that are distributed and systems that are sort of in the middle, all of them can still be captured by this framework. The interactions, who send what to what. And then more detailed things that I don't know if I will have time to go into, but uh, the way you model time, the way you model data, the way you model rules, of course, does a difference. Okay, uh, uh, quite a lot, by the way, in terms of engineering. Uh, maybe if you think abstract uh, to theory, it doesn't matter that much. Eh? But when you have to build a real system that has to be reactive in millisecond, decision that you take, uh, so I read in binaries data, or I read in JSON, can make a big difference. Okay, so th that is something to be aware. Okay, so the functional model. Eh? So le let's open the box. Okay, so the box has some component here that we call receiver, and uh, the receiver is basically uh, a way to get whatever is the data format outside and transform it in the internal data format. Okay, because you're getting this from the internet most likely. Okay, so it will come in a format which is not uh, an in-memory representation that you have to represent it in your programming framework. And it acts as a demultiplexer. So you will receive a lot of signals and you will have to throw them into your system probably in one single flow of information. Then on the other side, you have the forwarder. Okay, so your system does something and then you have to push to the sync. Okay, so this will do the opposite. Uh, you have to encode uh, this uh, information item in some protocol that will traverse the internet. And then uh, you will have to multiplex it. Okay, so it will have to go down to many multiple channels. Potentially you have to multicast it. Okay, so that is uh, the job of that stuff. Sorry. Okay, then uh, the slides that I'm skipping, are slides that say what, what, what I'm uh, telling you in more details, uh, are there for you to read. Okay, so I do not expect to go down to that level, otherwise it will take hours instead of the time that we have. Then this um, component here is called decider. Huh? So it gets the stream in and it has to decide whether uh, there is uh, some reason to push it down to the following component, which is called uh, producer. Okay, so the producer is uh, the one that is responsible to send out uh, the event that are detected. Okay, so here what you need uh, is a component that, based on what comes in, based on some history, uh, so you have to keep the state uh, of, uh, of of the current incoming messages, decides whether it makes uh, and the rules decide whether it makes sense to say to the component downstream, it's time to send a message, okay? So it does the detection, it does uh, the accumulation of partial results, uh, and uh, it fires the rules uh, when uh, it makes sense. Huh? On the other side here, what you have uh, is uh, the producer, okay? So the producer gets uh, the fire of the rules and as to do the, um, the resulting. Uh, so basically it takes uh, this uh, sequence of uh, data that are sent by the decider and it decides whether it makes sense or not to take an action. Uh, and the action normally is send a message. Uh, that is the kind of, uh, of things. Yeah. So since you are doing a fuzzing on the fly, is it like there is a, a threshold for the rules you are using, number of them? Yes, you will see that. Uh, do you mean threshold in time or threshold in number of rules? The number of rules, because the, no the more, the, the, the longest it's going to take, right? Uh, that's a very good question. What happens in reality, as you will see, is that system will bound the number of rules. Other system bounds the amount of data coming in. So they have techniques uh, to sample the data. Mm? So if I cannot cope with the full flow, I start sampling it. Okay, so this uh, will allow the, the rule to grow. Okay, and there are other systems that mix these two ideas up. And generally speaking, what you want, uh, being big data, is something that is elastic. So if I register one rule, it's sitting in memory. If I register 20,000 rule, 
it goes out in multiple nodes. And few data comes in, it stays with that layout. A lot of data comes in, it multiplies and scale out. Data goes down again, it shrinks again. Okay? So this is the kind of research that is, that is behind. Huh? So yes, what you said is a good engineering question. And all this system must have some limits. Some put limits on the rate, some put limits on the rules, some put limits on the number of processing nodes. Huh? But what you really is desirable is elasticity. Okay, so the more you ask, the more the system will take resources, and the more resources you put, the more you can cope with the flow of data. Uh, that is the kind of uh, uh, frame. Yeah. Is important like the uh, also the the aspect of uh, how the crafting and API should be now. The system are think to stay online on time, yeah. not turning them off, because we saw benchmarking one of them at the time they asked for big map was like. 10 times the time they actually process something. So yeah. they're very expensive to shut down. And yeah, the trade-off, you, you see the death trade-off also in your part. Yeah. yeah. You should think of them as uh, part of the internet. Mm -hmm. So if you want to switch off a router and have the internet working, it's hard, right? Because you have first to back up all the routing tables and then turn it off, and it takes time. And then if you want to turn out an, a, a one more router, you have to do a lot of work right on the network. This is the same. Eh? So this system, I suppose, you turn them on and they stay on forever. Eh? That is the kind of... Uh, and they are very hard, of course, eh, to, to build because uh, <laughs> they, they, must be <laughs> they must be able to, to cope with that. Eh? Okay. Um, there is one line here that is very interesting. Eh? So some system allow you to change the rule set based uh, on uh, the current results uh, of uh, the, the system query. Huh? Oops. It, it says uh, I ran out of uh, it. Yes, probably it's too hot. Yeah. Any question? <laughs> Why we wait for the projector to? Yeah, yeah. The framework that you showed in slide, you said that it can be adapted for centralized as well as yeah. the distributed environment. Yeah. So, so I'm just curious, how how do you adapt this to a distributed environment? Do you, do you distribute all the receivers or, or do you have one holistic receiver and producer and then you kind of multiplex those jobs and use the distributed yeah, so you Remember that this is a modeling framework, so it, it does not want to do to build system. It wants to describe systems. Okay, so uh, the general idea is that there are systems that are centralized, there are systems that are distributed, and there are systems that are a mix of them, and there are systems that scale up. Okay, so th that is the kind <coughs> of. Um, so, if the question is, <laughs> how do we build a system that is distributed, distribute and scale and elastic? Well, that is very hard. Very, very hard. So nowadays, there is no system that does uh, all the things that you want, OK? Because there is a problem which is called operator placement. So you have uh, a set of rules. You have to decide which rule you should put uh, to which node, OK? And that is already a problem. It's an MP problem, NPR the problem, per se. Then you have a problem of routing the data, OK? So I have this flow of data coming in, OK? So I have to route it to the nodes that have rules that match the data. It's useless to throw them to everybody. So fl floating is stupid, OK? And also routing, per se, is not an easy problem, OK? It's, it's polynomial, but it's, it's doable. But the point is, what if I do a bad balancing of my computational node because I have a node where I place a, a, a rule that apparently should fit there because I have this flow of data and I estimated that it should fit, but it's, there is a skew in the data? And that becomes the most important uh, uh, rule, OK? It, it starts firing, uh, uh, and uh, it, it goes beyond the computational power of that node where I place that one. It's, it's, it's terrible, right? Because what you have to do is to take uh, the plan that you did of distribution and rethink it. And it's not just the rethinking of a distribution. It's also the routing of the data. What about the data that are flowing around? So, you see, it's, it's very complex. Eh? So the problem is broken down in several problems, like uh, operator placement, uh, um, parallelization, distribution. And there are pieces of the puzzles 
but there is no system that I know that does all of that. Uh, so if you take things like uh, Storm, which is uh, one of the uh, uh, probably best known open source system, uh, you, you have a problem that once you, you place something in a node, that node can be overloaded, basically, uh, because there is no sim simple way for, for Storm to duplicate uh, nodes. If you take uh, a Spark Stream, Okay, which is uh, on the other side something that is very uh, is very good in uh, duplicating. It does stupid tasks, so it wants uh, the computation done in a task uh, on one of these flowing uh, uh, RDD to be stupid. Okay, so you cannot actually do the kind of operators that comes out from these languages. Mm -hmm. huh? So the trade-off is you want elasticity, you want distribution, you do uh, very simple things. Okay, you do counting, you do. Yeah? Or you want expressivity, in that case you are not elastic. And that is somehow the, the current state. Thanks. Yeah. Are there other reasoning techniques using decider but rules? Yes. Please. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Uh, but uh, they are very experimental. So I know that there are things that use bias, bias and networks, uh, and there are uh, others that try with. Um, um, other kind, I mean, of uh, knowledge representations, so more fuzzy and uh, behavioral oriented uh, techniques, but they are very experimental. So on the market, you will not find them. You will find them on only in academia. Uh, I'm aware that uh, Oracle built uh, a system in, uh, in experimental settings that use Bayesian networks for the decider, and uh, it is currently under testing. But that's the only one I am aware of uh, that is trying to do something which is not writing uh, event condition action rules. All, the, all of them use event condition action rules. I mean, the, the SMS use things that are written in SQL, like stuff, but you can, as I will sh show you in a moment, isolate uh, the event condition and the action in any case into there. Uh, so basically that's the, parad the paradigm. Backup. <laughs> okay. And one more row here. Okay. So you saw that there is a row that goes from here, loop, and goes back into here. This is very important huh? because in many cases you have you may run into problems where your result should be fit into the system again. Hmm? So you want to tell yourself something uh, basically. Um, the, the kind of, of things that require it are when you need recursive processing. Uh, so given an alert, you put it in, and based on the current situation and that alert, you generate some different alerts. Uh, and this happens in many different settings where you have this hierarchy of alarms that are fired by situations in the environment and other alarms. Okay? So in that sense, uh, you may need this uh, recursion uh, to, ta to take place. And here you see that uh, some system also allow you to go and get some uh, rather static read-only knowledge. Okay? And th this is one of the points where you see that uh, big data technology are really, I mean, putting velocity on one side and volume on the other side. Eh? Because in all this picture, there was no place to put volume. And now you learn that system exists, but what they want is it's read-only, and it's static. So you cannot update that piece of knowledge. And you can easily understand why. Eh? So if you are in a centralized system, you would probably want to fetch it in memory, okay, and forget that there is some copy somewhere else. So you don't want it to be updated and to deal with the updates. Hmm? And if it is in a distributed setting, even worse, because you have to take this bunch of data, cut them down according to your layout of the operators, and push to every single node the piece of this static knowledge. Eh? So even worse to have it updated. Eh? So that's why when uh, yesterday I was showing the diagram with volume and, ve and velocity, I was saying it drops very drastically in the beginning. Eh? Because most of the solution will not fit uh, large data in memory. Uh, and unless you are Google and you can pay for very big machines, you cannot allow the nodes themselves to have uh, hundreds of gigabytes of RAM. Eh? That, that will never pay off in a, in a standard setting. Eh? One last item here, uh, you saw that there is a clock there. Mm? This clock is very important uh, because most of the system will react uh, 
based on input. Uh, you have a stimulus, the stimulus creates uh, some uh, triggering of the uh, rules uh, and it will output some event. But what about uh, no input? Okay. So will the system fire unless you send uh, events in that will trigger the system reaction, it will basically stay silent. Okay, so we're still in those world where uh, the database is kind of active, but it, it needs input. Okay, so it must be an open active database. Huh? So what you can do in many of these systems is to set a, a component, which is a sort of clock, that will send you time event. Okay, so if time is passed and you are, should, are now supposed to generate a report, even if you don't have data in, you will generate the report. Eh? So that is for periodic evaluation, mostly. Eh? But it's a, a very important component. Component that miss it will prevent you to do several use cases where you want uh, time uh, to, to evolve uh, with, a with a given regular pace. Eh? That is uh, something that in, in many situations is important. OK, any question before uh, I go on? So th that is the functional model. Uh, if you didn't get, you can go and read uh, this slide, uh, and uh, this slide, uh, and this one. <laughs> okay, and all I said is written. Okay, so you, if you miss part of it and you really want to to grasp, you can go here. And then, if you are interested, you go and read the survey. Okay, where they really tell uh, the things. Next step is uh, to understand. Uh, um, the semantics of the processing. Okay, so we are talking about uh, messages going into the decider and uh, rules that are somehow activated by the data that comes in, and uh, this uh, history. Okay, that is keeping uh, a sort of window on the, on the recent past that really matters. Huh? And of course, the knowledge base, uh, because that is also part uh, of the information you need in order to compute the current answer. You w may wonder, is this enough? Because it looks already too much, right? And the answer is, unfortunately, not. <laughs> so in, um, in these uh, examples here, you can see that uh, more or less, uh, you can get done what we were saying, right? If there is smoke and the temperature is high, then, uh, or uh, in this example here, you have windows uh, over the stream of smoke, the stream of temperature. You do some joining on the area, and then you output, yes, uh, there is a problem. But uh, if you really want to, to understand what's happening, uh, you need to go one level down into what is the selection policy? Okay, so I get this data in, but how do I select them? Second, the consumption policy. I have used this event to generate an output. Can I forget it or shall I keep it in memory, okay, in the history? And the last one, as I was uh, saying before, is what about load shedding? Huh? So the behavior of the query on a database uh, is data, schema, and query, right? Here, you may not use all the data because uh, you basically sampling them, okay? So you need to know which is the sampling technique in order to know which is the right answer, okay? And of course you want sampling techniques that the more you sample, the less accurate the data are, but this is graceful, okay? It's not that it drops drastically. So I, if I sample 90%, I have most, almost the same result, and if I sample 10%, I still want 80% correctness, uh, because if I choose a technique of sampling, that if I choose 80% uh, drops to 20 of correctness, then of course I'm not sampling, I'm throwing basically the, the entire system business logic away. Yeah? So let's try to understand what I mean by selection policy. Yeah? So the selection policy means I have a message coming in, let's say A, and I have a rule, A and B. So what I do, the first time I see it, is I put it in history. I observe an A. What if uh, another A come? Okay. Do I have to decide. Mm? Because uh, what I may want to do is uh, to put another A into the history, or I may want to throw it away. Okay. And the, this is important when you get B. Right? Because when you get B, 
if you have thrown away A, you will get just one message out. If you are keeping both, you will have two messages out, right? So that is what uh, the selection uh, policy means. Huh? So different systems will have different uh, mm. semantics, uh, operational semantics, that's what it's called, huh? behind this. And somehow these are the, the possibilities. Huh? So if let's call A0 the first one we receive and A1 the second, I can generate uh, A0B, A1B as results. So basically, I send out the Cartesian product, if I, I think in terms of joins. Huh? Or I may want uh, to keep the most recent, sorry, the most recent, or keep the, the, the oldest. Okay? So these are basically the free potential policy. Huh? I keep everything and I throw out the Cartesian product. I keep only the first, I keep only the last. Huh? If you start playing the game, you will see that there are many reasons to keep the last two, to keep the first three, and so many systems then actually f give you more interesting selective policy, where you can say last, or you can say first, and then put a number uh, to remember a given amount of, of input. Huh? Indeed, what you cannot do is to remember everything, right? So you got that. Huh? History is in main memory, and it will make your system crash if you don't forget. So there must be a way to throw things out, OK? So uh, what I said written in slides, OK? So if you want, go back here. And this is uh, how it is actually implemented uh, in the language that my colleague are proposing. Huh? So they have uh, an operator which is called each which is the Cartesian product. We have an operator that is called last, that actually is uh, taking the only the last, and we have another one that is called first, and we have more that say the n first, the n last, and so forth. It's very important to note that there is always this within, okay? The within is crucial because you have to forget, okay? So this says, for each temperature event, uh, where the area is the one where you get smoke, and the temperature is above 50, and the two events are within one minute, OK? So if uh, you get smoke, and then 10 minutes after you have a rise in temperature, you don't trigger anything. You have, you have already forgot the smoke, OK? But if the two things happen within <coughs> one minute, then it makes sense to say it, OK? Any question? All right. Consumption policy. Huh? So now you got that you get A in and that you put it there and that you get B in and then you throw something out. OK, so but down to this point, it's OK. But what about A now? Hmm? Shall I forget it now that I fired an event or shall I keep it in memory? Hmm? Again, this is about the execution semantics. Huh? System may decide that once you have used an event, you throw it away. Other system may decide that you should keep it there and uh, wait for other B to come. Okay. So when the second B comes, you basically have uh, these uh, two options. Huh? You uh, don't say anything because uh, you have already said it, or you you basically say it again. Okay, the same information. And again. What they, they did in, uh, in Tesla, is uh, to have a standard behavior that somehow is not consuming. Okay? So if uh, you write a rule where you say, for each temperature event that matches the smoke within one minute, uh, if w when smoke comes, uh, fire, 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 okay, fire, 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 and you repeat it, if they are within the window, if you want to explicitly state uh, that uh, your behavior is once uh, you have used it, you do nothing, okay, then what you do is you write, uh, what is it? Consuming temp, okay? So it, this is saying you get high temperature, high temperature, high temperature, high temperature, smoke, then you fire because there is each, fire, 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 one for each pair. OK, and then because you've wrote consume temp, all the temps are forgotten. 
and you can simply go on waiting for other messages. So when the new smoke comes in, you don't fire again. Uh, the smoke, 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 smoke. Okay? Fire, 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 sorry. Okay? Make sense? Uh, so that is the consumption policy. And for the load shedding, well, here the things are much more complex, uh, so I, I cannot go in, into it. And they become stochastics. Okay? So you can actually don't you cannot know what the right answer is. You can know with some uh, margin of error, which are some statistical value of accuracy based some uh, policy that you use in the load shedding. Huh? But this is a very interesting uh, research setting because unless you're able to do elasticity and then you can treat all the data, you need load shedding. Huh? Because in one of the two scenarios, your machine is going to blow up uh, as soon as you have too, many, too much data. Okay, any question? Yeah. How do you consider the time, for example, one minute that you mentioned in the beginning? Is there any other choices for you that, you know, for example, two minutes or one second that might relate to the case that you are checking uh, this system? So w most of the complex event processing language have uh, a way to, to state uh, a time pattern that is quite sophisticated. Uh, so basically, you can say from s milliseconds up to days. And uh, th the way you put it will change the way the system behind does things. So if you put millisecond, it will try to do join in memory. If you put day, it will put data at rest. So I mean, th that is fully considered in most of the system. Um, but was that the question? Yeah. OK. <laughs> OK. Um, so you mentioned about sampling. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So the, the basic, the baseline, so the baseline algorithm is you create an histogram of a, um, of a current input. So you basically have a count of every distant input that uh, you have seen since ever. And then you sample based on the Instagram. Mm -hmm. So if uh, you receive tons of A and very few B, you basically sample, you basically concentrate uh, your sample on A and you take all the B. OK, so that, that's the way this algorithm works. And if you think to the fire example, is OK, right? So I see temperature going up and down, up and down. And normally, they do not matter. But when I receive those few smoke signal, those really matter. OK, so in that setting, this Instagram-based uh, uh, sampling policy works. And it was shown to work pretty well in many scenarios. So the, um, the benchmark here is called linear road benchmark. And it's basically saying there are a number of lanes uh, in, uh, in a road, and there are cars on top of it. And what you want to do is variable tolling. Uh, so you, you want to change uh, how much it costs to traverse a given part of this road based on the state of congestion. Okay? And you can easily see that, for instance, uh, you can sample the car position quite uh, rowly, and it doesn't matter. But when there are accidents that will create congestions, you should not uh, forget them. And if you create an Instagram, right, you will keep receiving car changing positions, and only here and there you will get accidents. And accidents are the, the part that really matters, right? So that's uh, it's an, it's a good example. More sophisticated techniques uh, create wavelets, uh, another, I mean, compact representation of the past that will guide your sampling. Uh, but basically, the idea is compact representation of the past and sampling based on the compact representation of the past. That is. Uh, No, yeah, for discrete. I was describing a discrete, right? You have event A, event B, event C, event E. So it's really for discrete. It's not for continuous. No, no, no. They do not work in the continuous spectrum. I mean, uh, it's high temperature, the thing that you remember. Okay. It's not, not the uh, yeah, not the value. Okay. No, no, th that's a, a critical thing, really. Discretizing and then doing something is crucial for uh, the scalability. But there's uh, an open research question how to do dynamic discretization. Yeah, so. Deployment. <laughs>
Uh, so here you see that potentially these data streams are geographically distributed and it really makes no sense to bring them all, all, all one in one place in order to process them. Eh? It's a very stupid architecture, the one that asks something distributed to go in one place to process it where you can actually delegate the processing out. Eh? So if you go and check the, the current situation, you will find that uh, there are really a, a different amount uh, of, uh, of deployment architecture and uh, they are sort of orthogonal, or at least you want them to be orthogonal to the functional model. Huh? If uh, they are not orthogonal, like in many cases, you are not happy. Huh? That, that is uh, what a customer will say if you try to sell it. So we said uh, centralized, cluster-based, and networked uh, over a geographical uh, space. Those are the ones that we may call distribution. And as I was uh, saying before, most of the existing systems are centralized. Mm -hmm. So if you go and buy uh, Oracle uh, Composite Event Processor, it's a centralized system. If you go and buy Microsoft Stream Insight, it's a centralized system, and so forth, right? So only if you go and check uh, into the sensor network world, you will start finding distributed systems that really works uh, in a distributed way. Some of them are based on clusters. Right? So you, there, are, there are a number of companies that are trying to sell uh, complex event processor on cluster, but normally they do not do elasticity. Okay, so you create a network, you place your operator once, and then you have done. Okay, so you do you do not replan the topology. Yeah, which is what you read here. Now, um, as I was telling before, the problem here is. Uh, what is called the operator placement. Uh, so you have all these rules. What you have to do is to decide how the rules are actually distributed over your computational network. Uh, and there are very stupid ideas like uh, I place a rule in a node and that's it. And more sophisticated idea that try to implement things like rate. Does make rate sense to you? It's one of the standard algorithms for rule firing. Okay, they try to use rate in a distributed fashion. And so you don't place the rules, but you take the rules, you chop them down in components that you can somehow maximize in doing together. Okay, so for instance, if you have two rules that have the same body apart from one condition, you create a rule with that body that is evaluated only once, and then you have another follow-up rules that is only evaluated when the first one is fired. Okay, so what Rated does is really Unassembling, disassembling all the rules and building a new rule set that is the best one for solving the problem. Okay, so this is already a, 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 a one complex thing. Sh shall I take the rules or shall I chop them down and use the operator placement problem? Okay, but once it's done, hmm, what you have to do then is uh, to assign this operator to nodes, and then it's done. Eh? Normally, you're happy with this. The efficient rules. <laughs> how, how do you generate the most important rules for all of the rules you consider it um, equally? So <laughs> that's the answer. Okay. Generally speaking, it's an RPR problem. Okay. And uh, most of the system does it based on statistics uh, on the data. And so if you don't have uh, statistics uh, on the flows, it's very hard to solve it because you have no idea of exactly what you were saying, because relevance is not uh, this uh, part of the body is used in 22 rules, uh, so I should put it together and, and nothing else. Uh, relevance is also this body is fired uh, more often than that body, sh so I should place it in many different nodes and cut down the space uh, of data that I send so that they go to these different nodes. Uh, and, and that is something that requires statistics on the input. So it's, this, it's a mix of these two things. Yeah? If you want to check it, we did the PhD course with uh, Gianpaolo and, and Alessandro. And this is the, this, the set of slides where we tell almost everything you want to know and maybe you don't want to know on operator placement. Okay? So that's something you may want to check in case. So, so for Spark streaming, yeah. um, if we are coding these rules, let's say, um, even 
in that this rules in spark setting they get translated to some map reduced or some join jobs only which which are so 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 even in that we are not the kind of executing one rule in one node but rather we have distributed that rule yep. as jobs so 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 how does that differ from the from the frame framework you mentioned uh, i forgot the name of that stuff from the r Or something you mentioned, right? Which can somebody? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Eh? Yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah. right. Um, yeah. So, if I got the question, okay. So, what you are going to do is you are doing micro batching, okay. So, you take this input stream and uh, Sparkle stream will basically cut it in slices, mm -hmm. okay, and it creates uh, a parallelizable data set. Okay, then what you do is you apply all the transformations. Okay, right? What you know is that uh, uh, Spark will apply the transformation in the order that you write them, right? Good. And uh, each of them is a map reduced job. It, it does work faster because it's in memory, but basically it's one map reduce, results, second map reduce, right? It creates RDD after each of them. Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. So the problem is that. Uh, that works if you know exactly what's the kind of input and you have to process it uh, with one pipeline. What if you have uh, 22 different rules? Huh? You have <coughs> to start coding uh, and, and it's not very easy. All the filtering, okay, up front. And what if uh, then you generate data in given points of these steps that should go back in? Yeah, because that is often the case if you think about it. Yeah? So if you don't have to do something very simple like I count the event of a given type, I average a given stuff, right? But you really have to do there is an A followed by B, not during C, within 10 minutes. That will turn out to be a, a number of joins. Uh, one condition that you should remember, not C, okay? And another condition that you should remember within a given time that is very hard to code. So if it is A and B, yes, you do it with Spark, no problem. If it is A and B and C and, yes, you do it. Even the ORs, you do it, okay? Because they are implemented with joins and filters on one single stream, okay? So it works with Spark. But if you have to start doing very complex stuff, especially if the result can be, the rule is, fire a C if A followed by B, but not C, okay? Of course, it's, it's, it's very difficult to encode in Spark yeah? because you have to loop back and to do a, a number of things that are not very easy to do. Yeah? But yes, in that sense, it does the parallelization for you. You have one kilobyte in processing memory in one, pro in one of your CPU. You have a terabyte in and chop it down and use the cluster. Yeah, that's true. Yeah? But it's, the problem is the complexity of the it's pattern. Not as expressive as yeah. yeah, that's the idea. But still, I like it. Eh? I really like it. Yeah. <laughs> I believe that is a great uh, step forward in this world. Because I don't like Storm. I, I, I was using it, but I don't like it because it's, um, um, it's really too tough. The topology that you built, this uh, idea that you have to put the coding in that way doesn't really allow elasticity, whereas Spark does it I mean, without you caring about it, so that works. And then the idea of uh, micro-batching and in-memory exchange, uh, of course, does work. And so I remember that we did back in 2009 an implementation on S4, which was uh, a kind of uh, incremental Hadoop implementation by Yahoo, but it was writing on disk, right? So it basically, it was not f working, yeah? because you have to wait minutes to process seconds of data. Yeah, so. Okay. Um, yeah, so all of this is already discussed, right? So it's not just an operator placement problem. You have a network, you have to maintain it, you have to gather information about uh, a number of different things that are happening. So you realize that it's not that easy. Okay. And then there is the dynamic problem, which I discussed already. OK. So am I late? Yes. <laughs> OK, so let's see what's here. OK, the interaction model. Well, 
this is pretty simple, okay? Each of these components can pull and push, okay? Many system will have uh, um, only the push, only the pull, or a mix of them, okay? So you may want to, to have all of them in a, in a standard setting. The time model, this is very interesting, but maybe it's, it's too detailed, but uh, j just to understand it, uh, the way data stream management system do it is uh, things come to me over time, whether they have a timestamp or not, it doesn't matter, because I will assign a timestamp where they enter, and then I will do things based on that. Um, other more in the complex event processing world actually say no, actually time matters and I want to keep it. Huh? And one way is to use causality rules. So I don't keep uh, the time, but I keep uh, a network of causal links. So uh, I got an A, I got a B, and the rule says if you have an A followed by a B, generate a C. So when I put C, I also say I generated C out of A and B. And, and I push forward a sort of partial order that is used by the engine. And that is what casual means. Absolute is the way you want the engine to work. Right? So data comes with time, and I use the, cur the time which comes with the data to, to tell what it should do. And uh, interval based, uh, it looks like the most fantastic idea on Earth uh, because instead of saying this thing is happening now, you say this starts happening at this point in time and finish at that point in time, okay? Which sounds as a more expressive stuff, but you end up really in, com in, a, in a complexity that is hardly understandable. Huh? Just to give you an example, jump into that slide. Imagine that you have all these intervals, and which is the immediate successor of A. Guess? C? C? B, why not? B. <laughs> B. <laughs> yeah? You see, the point is, it depends on what you're looking at, right? So if you are looking at something that was true just after the end of A, it will be A. It will be B. But come on, B started before A. So uh, it doesn't match. So really, you run into this kind of complexity. So if it is not B, then probably it's C, D, E. But the immediate successor, which one is it? Is C because it ends before E? Yeah? So this open up uh, a number of alternative algebras uh, that are not so easy to, uh, to understand first. And then you should think about somebody have to code the rules, right? So you have to put very semantics, that is one that uh, uh, somebody that has, has in mind a problem really wants. Huh? So you cannot choose all the possible semantics because that will create uh, an impossible system. You have to choose one. That one may not be good for given use cases. Huh? So uh, <laughs> it's both uh, theoretical problem and the engineering thesis one. Yes, and the usability one. Yeah. Conjunction means? Of Conjunction, of yes, okay. Of all of these things and then test. Maybe that's easier or much faster. Or I didn't get the idea. What's it? Different semantics, I guess. No, so all conjunction. of these, you can capture all of them in one conjunction. I mean, state. Right. Right? Yeah. Uh, of conjunction. Yes. So at the, and, and there, like, you can capture all of what you are saying in one statement and then check it. Oh, maybe, yeah. No, no, maybe. May, may the point is that uh, it must be usable. So you, as a, as a writer of a query of a rule, you want to predict the answer. Given input, you want to be sure that you know the answer. And the more the semantics is complex, uh, the more it's hard for you that write the rule to know what it will happen. Eh? So that's why most of the systems do not do what you propose. They stick to one simple semantics. They choose. Uh, uh, the one that uh, is true after the end uh, of a current event. That is the, the most used semantics, eh? which will tell B. Okay? Other will say the one that starts closer, which is not true at that point, that starts closer uh, and then ends before the others. Okay? That's the second most frequent semantics. Eh? But if you want to read, there is uh, a lot of literature about this, uh, time representation and so forth. The data model we can skip. 
uncertainty may be something you were also having in mind, right? So uh, I, I take all possibilities and let's see what happens. Um, the data flows, the rules. Uh, yeah, maybe this one and then uh, I, I give you time to, to do your part. So basically, we should distinguish between two different types of rules. Those that are called transformation rules and those that are called uh, detecting rules. And the difference between the two is that uh, the transformation rules are typical of the data stream management system. I have these streams in, I generate a new stream out, but it's a transformation of the current data. Okay. Whereas detection rule is uh, I keep sort of state, finished state machine of the current words, and then when new data come in, I fire things. So really the state machine is a finished state machine is a way to capture the current state of a word, uh, and then to detect something that you're looking for. Uh. So that is uh, the big difference between compressive and processors and data stream management system. And when uh, you go into the languages, you, you will see them very easily. Uh. So uh, transformation languages uh, will have filters, joins, aggregations, uh, and they will look more or less like this. Yeah? So I have uh, uh, conditions, uh, I generate uh, outputs, uh, and uh, I join things, right, in mostly an SQL-like uh, uh, language. I skip the imperative, that uh, is important, but uh, we don't have time. Whereas in the detection language, what you do is basically writing uh, a condition and then an action. Uh, so rise a fire in a given area for a given temperature measurement, taking into input uh, the, the stream with a given condition, and then you do the joins. Huh? But what matters is to see that uh, you are doing exactly the same, right? So uh, it's just two different ways uh, of writing the same. Huh? And here you have slides where this is uh, fully described, okay? So it goes there and says, look, this is uh, a selection, a projection, a renaming, and you can do the same uh, in, a, in a composite event projection. And, uh, you can do conjunction and disjunction, and uh, that is going to, to happen uh, in any case, huh? and so forth. So l let's not go down to, to this level because it may take too much. What? Uh, so you yeah, indeed, you are doing it. Yeah. I, I believe that you, you, you can give your part. Before we go there, did you get an idea? Okay, so there is a lot of details and that uh, I prefer to skip. Um, what Ricardo will do, will show you one specific language, uh, which I believe will make uh, what I said concrete. It's not uh, all the languages, it's one, but uh, probably will make many of the things that I said uh, concrete. <laughs> 